Good evening, everyone. My name is Danielle Mitchell. I'm the CEO and founder of Black Women in Clinical Research. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are going to be discussing regulatory affairs. And before we get started, I would like to introduce our co-host. Courtney, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. I am Courtney. I am a member of Black Women in Clinical Research and also a CRA1 with PPD, part of Thermo Fisher. Um, and I'm glad to be here tonight. Um, I'm hoping that I can learn a lot about regulatory. <laughs> Thank you, Courtney. I just realized that my, uh, it says Daniel Mitchell at the end of your... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you can be Daniel Mitchell number two. <laughs> All right. Oh, let's see. And also we have my husband, Jeremy Mitchell, who is um, helping out this evening. So Jeremy, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes. Thank you, Danielle. I am Jeremy Mitchell, um, jack of many trades, um, currently the head of sales and partnerships at Black Women in Clinical Research, as well as the COO and co-founder of MedDefend. I'm trying to find my hand gesture so I can um, do some clapping. <laughs> but yes, thank you so much, Mr. Mitchell. Okay. And we're also going to introduce our speakers tonight. So Sequita, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Good evening, everyone. My name is Sequita Lindsay, and I am the CEO and president of Lindsay Regulatory Affairs Consulting. Thank you, Sequita. And Anisha. Good evening, everybody. My name is Anisha Wharton. I'm the vice president of regulatory affairs at Avail Oncology, which is based out of Boston. Um, I currently reside in Atlanta, Georgia, and I look forward to today's conversation. Thank you, ladies. And Anisha and I, we went to the same HBCU, the wonderful Clark Atlanta University. Whoop, whoop, had to throw that in there. <laughs> Enterprise. Right, right. And so, all right, I'm going to go ahead and jump in with these questions. Okay, so can you ladies please share a brief overview of your career journey in clinical research? And when it comes to you know, clinical research, regulatory affairs, what are some key milestones and um, transitions that you've had in the industry? Actually, um, you know, I've lived a lot of different places and I lived 15 years in the Bay Area out in California. And when I originally finished graduate school, um, I was studying epidemiology. I found it a little challenging to get a job, you know, 2004, you know, I was bright eyed and bushy tailed. I was ready to take on public health by storm. And, you know, I could not find a job, um, you know, at that time. So I actually got a ping from somebody who worked as a recruiter in pharma. And so they actually hired me initially to work at um, Bayer pharmaceuticals in Berkeley at their manufacturing facility. Um, I was supposed to be a trainer in QA, but I literally, for the four months I was there, I didn't do anything except sit at my desk reading magazines all day. I was totally like irritated with that. I love to make money, but I need to feel like I am, you know, being productive and making a difference. So, you know, I asked them to try to find me another assignment and they did at Genentech. And at that particular time, it was in a, a group called Regulatory Intelligence who supported the entire company to provide a regulatory intel on Genentech's competitor products. Um, while I was there, um, my group created this massive database of all of Genentech's competitor products. You know, we used to do regulatory assessments to help people navigate um, you know, different phases of investigation for molecules that they were working on. And so I was at Genentech for a couple of years doing that. And once my contract was up, I actually went to go work at a small company, a small ophthalmology company um, across the Bay. And that kind of spearheaded my regulatory affairs, regulatory operations work that has now been 20 years 
um, in the making across small and large companies. I've, I've worked at uh, Merck Oncology. I've worked at smaller uh, pulmonology companies in the Bay Area as well. Um, and I think for me, the past 15 years I've been in oncology, um, it's been such a, um, working in oncology is a highlight because many of us know people who have cancer and developing drugs for people who have renal cell carcinoma, head and neck cancer, lung cancer, where we can potentially give them more time with their families is something that drives, you know, the work that I do, um, you know, as a regulatory affairs scientist and professional. Uh, so for me, you know, the highlights of my career have been, um, the milestones have been, you know, getting drug approvals for um, Keytruda, uh, 20 of them in a row, for supplemental applications for new dosing regimens, um, and really just being able to, that's like the highlight, getting your drug approvals, getting orphan drug designation, getting your accelerated approval for things, you know, those kind of regulatory milestones, um, you know, have been really exciting. And so I look forward to, you know, continuing the, those journeys with the programs that I work on now for head and neck and renal cell carcinoma. That's very impressive, Anisha, 20 years in the game. So I'm sure you have a lot of knowledge to share of, in how to navigate these challenges in the industry. And also, I feel like what you said was really important, you know, finding your passion and your reason why, you know, you want to get in clinical research. I, I feel like it's really important because you need to know on those hard days, what, what are you doing this for? And how can your passion push you through these challenges? Absolutely. Because as most people, if you're in the industry, know that a lot of what we do is cyclical. You have really, you know crazy highs where you're working nonstop trying to get these drug submissions in. And sometimes you have the times when you're like not as busy when you're working on, you know, protocols and um, getting sites, you know, starting up for some trials. So it's not, it may not be as busy, but those busy times really make you thankful that you love what you do because it can be really stressful. Um, but the end result is getting the patients who need the medicines, making sure they have access to that, those therapies. You know what I mean? Especially for people who look like us, black and brown folks who aren't typically um, involved in a lot of clinical research, figuring out ways to increase that diversity across you know, our programs, I think is important as well. Yeah, and I have um, a background in regulatory and oncology as well. So we share that. And, and like you were mentioning about passion, my passion was um, breast oncology. So um, regulatory is a beast, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, <laughs> but we're gonna let the professionals talk about that because I, I definitely, I was like, oh, regulatory, this this, this is this is, this is is a lot. Um, but I'm definitely let uh, Sequita share as well. Yeah. Um... So during my time um, as a student at the illustrious Winston-Salem State University, because I'm going to throw that in there, <laughs> I had I really didn't know what I wanted to do um, in life at that point. Um, so I, you know, I did take like a generic interdisciplinary studies degree and didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I had the unique opportunity of working in production for a medical device company, um, Cook Medical to be exact. And they created endoscopy products. And so I was working in production and I saw an opening for regulatory affairs associate. And I was like, well, what is that? You know, like, what is that? So I was like, okay, let me go ahead and apply. And I, fortunately, they, they took a chance on me and I got the position. This was without even having my degree at that point, because I was actually working on my associate's degree. Um, then went to Wisconsin State. So um, I started doing minor things in regulatory, learning about um, international registrations, learning CE marking for the EU, things like that. So um, I was really excited just to learn the back end because a lot of people don't know from a pre-market and a post-market standpoint on how a device is created and it's used either in the hospitals or in a clinician's office. So. Um, that was very fascinating to me. So I did move around as well. I lived in Oregon for a while and worked for a um, 
a foot and ankle um, company that did plates and screws. So I was on the foot and ankle team and that was my first exposure of concept to launch the full like life cycle. And that was very interesting to learn. And then I moved back to the East Coast and I lived in Georgia for a while, about 30 minutes outside of Atlanta in Noonan. Um, the company Stryker had just acquired a company called Porex Surgical and they manufactured craniomaxillofacial implants. Um, so these were custom implants for the face, brain, things like that. So that was my first exposure to custom devices. Um, that was on quality and regulatory. So that was also giving me exposure on the auditing aspect um, from quality and learning the regulations and understanding how you have to do it against ISO 1345, all these different types of regulations and, um, and standards. So then I moved back home to North Carolina and I started working for Teleflex and I actually did a linear position with both with during my time at Teleflex. I started out in the Asia Pacific group and then I went to Latin America group and I wanted to get that rest of world experience from a registration standpoint. I wanted to understand not just from domestic, but from international and understand the ins and outs of how to market a product into another country and, and have it approved. Um, and then when I left there, because I wanted to learn, I wanted to kind of get more leadership experience. I took a chance um, to move to a small startup company that was in their clinical trial of their drug eluding stint. So that gave me the exposure of being with a combo product, um, the drug side and the uh, device side which allowed me to work with FDA on CDRH and CDER. Um, and that was very interesting because I was instrumental in submitting their first IDE to FDA. And that was a beast back in 2008 when um, everything was paper. <laughs> and so we had over 45 binders that we had to um, express up to FDA to get our IDE in. Um, I don't miss so, those days, I will say that. Okay, okay. I was, I was in, I was in the office for forty eight hours straight <laughs> just to get those together. Um, but again, the exposure to that was something I, I can't even, even the long hours still just something that sits with me. Just shows the perseverance that we can as in, as professionals to do what we wanted, what we need to do. Um, because we are, we know that we have life-saving drugs and products that are going to, you know, save someone or at least make a better quality of life. Uh, again, so that gave me experience on the clinical, um, the clinical research um, side of things, helping them go through a lot of their clinical trials, which was overseas at the time because they were trying to get the uh, clinical trial in the United States. So they were using the Bayesian approach where they used some of the studies from the OUS to try to make their study a little bit smaller for the US. Um, but unfortunately, because it was a small startup, you know how that is if your funding starts to kind of be a little weary because a lot of your testing and things aren't kind of panning out, you're you're gonna lose your you're gonna lose your um your backing. So unfortunately that company ended up um, having a reduction in force. And something told me, hey, go start a consulting company. Um, that was going to be the end game for me. And when I say end game, I mean, like, when it's time for me to retire. But I thought, let me go ahead and try it now. And I, we started the, the consulting company in 2018. And we've been consulting ever since. And I like that aspect because I'm able to touch several products in various arenas. Cardiovascular, um, respiratory, anesthesia. Um, pelvic health, a lot of cardiac, but it's it's been amazing to see the various products that are out here on the market saving lives. And I think that's probably one of the rewarding parts is being a part of that uh, that um, aspect to bring life saving drugs and devices to the market. Thank you, Sequita. I love how when you have attended an HBCU that we throw in. <laughs> 
Like when I say it, I'm like the Clark Atlanta. You're like the you know, illustrious <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Winston State. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I, I love that too. And then, you know, I'm thinking as well, like I had my experience with medical devices as well. And it's it's really different um from being yeah. in in the industry. And I know that you know that might be an option for someone that's on the call mm -hmm. today to you know, think about. I always devices. try to bring people to the dark side just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, because when I was doing it, it was um uh the the wearable devices. So you know, you had your watch that was monitoring, and so mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, this is a little bit different. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, so I did that for a little while, and I was like, let me get back over to uh. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I'll jump in. You guys kind of pretty much answered this question, but if it's anything else that you would like to add. Um, what initially sparked your interest in pursuing a career in regulatory affairs? I know we kind of touched on it, but if there's any additional information you guys want to share. To be honest with you, it wasn't that I was going into it because I was interested in regulatory. It honestly was because of the initial experience that I had with the contract position at Bayer and the manufacturing of it not being stimulating enough for me. As somebody who had a background in science and statistics, I needed something where, you know, I'm used to reading data and analyzing data and, you know, making assessments of data. I was just sitting in a desk doing nothing, getting paid. I didn't like it. You know, that sounds crazy, but it's like, I want to be productive. And so when the recruiter called and said, hey, we have this position in regulatory intelligence, I didn't know what it was. I had the slightest idea. And when I was in college, there was no track in college or grad school that was centered on biotechnology or pharma whatsoever. So that was my first you know, experience. And I think for me, what was exciting was being able to use my analytical skills, especially in Reg Intel, because that kind of sets the stage for a lot of the things that you will need when you're developing like regulatory strategy, when you're planning your submissions, you need that background, that precedent, all those things that you know um, that you find out so you don't have to recreate the wheel when you're planning your programs. You know, those are the types of things that I, that I was doing. So that was really exciting for me at the time to come in on that stage instead of going right into reg affairs or reg operations. Yeah, I would I would kind of piggyback on the same thing. I didn't necessarily just say, oh, I wanted to go into regulatory. Um, I didn't want to be in production forever, but I was fascinated with the products that were being made and I did want to learn more about it. So when regulatory happened to fall into my lap, I kind of stuck with it after that. Um, I, it was fascinating to understand, like I said, the background behind um regulatory affairs and how to get a product to the market um, or the clinical trials that need to, to happen for a product to even go into the market. So I kind of just, it just stuck with me after that. After that one position, I didn't, I didn't think to go anywhere else because at that point, after I received my bachelor's degree, I immediately went to get my master's degree in regulatory affairs. Um, so I have my master's in regulatory affairs for drugs, biologics, and medical devices because I just knew I needed something to kind of put me a step ahead of, you know, the counterparts that I was working with because in regulatory and, and, and clinical research just in general, it's not a lot of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I can't tell you when I first started, I didn't see anybody that looked like me and actually- nope. Depending on the company that you go to, you probably won't see anybody that looks Absolutely. like Absolutely. There, and I, I make it a point on my own team because I am a hiring manager. I'm gonna make it as diverse as possible, so mm -hmm. everybody on my team is mm -hmm. a person of color except one person. And mm -hmm. so, you know, at the end of the day, I'm gonna represent every day, all day. Yeah, I know that's, my well, that's team true. Is be representative of that too. No, that's true. And I, I've, I've, I've been in the medical device field, like I said, for 20 years, 17 of those years in regulatory and still to this day, it's not as diverse as it should be um, at all. Yeah. I and mean, I've worked for several companies who I'm still the only person in the regulatory department. And I remember, Sequita, that you had mentioned about the conference that was coming up yeah. and, you know, and I'm gonna let you um, throw a plug out there at the end so that people who are also interested 
can attend this conference also. So I know, you know, we talked about, you know, how you pivot into the regulatory affairs, but can you talk about your responsibilities that you have and the challenges that you have um, in this in this industry or in this um, regulatory affairs, I should say? Do you want me to go? Kahita, you can go yeah, first. Go mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my responsibilities really is compliance to make sure that the company is adhering to industry standards and any regulations that are set out. Um, and it really depends on the company and what they're certified in. If they, from you know, from a U.S. standpoint, they need to have their ISO 1345 quality management system, or they need to have um, their EU MDR, which is from the EU, the European Union, when they're trying to get their product CE mark to be able to um, register in the European Union. So it really just depends. It like I said, on the company and where they are in their 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 um, um, journey of getting a product to the market. So I look over regulations, I give their interpretation, I do a lot of regulatory assessments, global regulatory assessments. So that could be um, Latin America, Asia Pacific, European Union, Canada, United States. Um, I do a lot of reg assessments, but depending on the changes, um, it could be a minor change. It could be from a colorant being changed on a product to the length of the product being changed all the way into you're now changing the material of the product. So it, it varies. Um, I dealt with various classifications of the product from a class one all the way to a class three. Um, classifications change depending on the market. Um, and it is it really is a a game of just making sure that the company is adhering to standards. That's that's the number one for me is standards and regulations and interpret them in a way that that the lay someone who's not in regulatory understands what is required um, to be successful in submitting your documentation to a health authority and it being approved. Thank you, Sequita. Yeah. For me, I would say it, um, you know, as Sarita mentioned, it depends on the company. It really does depend on the size of the company. When you work for smaller companies, you will wear many hats. And I think starting off in regulatory at a small company was a really great thing for me because I got to put my hand in a lot of different things. Um, so for me, I'm like one of the chief um, <coughs> legal slash compliance officers. I am the conduit of information between my company and Food and Drug Administration and all global regulatory health agencies. So anytime, um, you know, any of those agencies have questions, they have requests, they send those requests through me and I work to answer them either through my team or cross-functionally. Um, I assist the team in, um, writing clinical protocols, other clinical documents like IVs. I help with study startup activities globally. So there's a, a lot of activities that have to happen when you want to do clinical trials. And so a lot of the activities that are um, central to that involve regulatory affairs and getting those clinical trials approved locally and your local jurisdiction and, and also nationally if you choose to do global regulatory um, trials. Um, it's also, I think one of the things that helps in regulatory is having a um, background in science, um, being able to speak the same language as your teammates and assessors is important to understanding you know, whether it's a uh, drug pharmacology, mechanism of action of your, of your product, thinking about strategy. And so I also help the team set the global regulatory strategy for our product. So what you need to do from phase one to a, approval to get that drug on the, par on the market. Um, I help to write drug labels. So, you know, you guys, when you get your medicines at the pharmacy, those little, you know, I would, um, help to write those as well um, with the team. And then at the end of the day, I'm gonna be honest, people see regulatory as the all knowing body of information that if nobody else knows the answer, 
we can go to regulatory and regulatory will help us figure it out. So sometimes I get like these crazy questions like, Anisha, I can't figure this out. Can you help me like try to find an answer to this question? And I'm just like, okay, this isn't really regulatory, but yes, I will help you. Let's, you know, work together to figure this out. And you really just working cross-functionally with the drug safety team, clinical operations, tech ops, which, ha which um, handles all the chemistry manufacturing and controls and kind of being like the glue that helps the team stick together as the one who is in like a leadership position on these cross-functional teams. So, you know, sometimes I call myself the chief um, stick wagger, keeping everybody in check, making sure we're doing the things that we're supposed to do in the way that we're supposed to based on national and local regulations. So, yeah, it's kind of a, uh, <laughs> yeah, depending on the company, you could be doing all kinds of stuff, child. Let me tell you. <laughs> so, yeah. I wanted to piggyback just on that a bit. She's very, she's correct when it comes to like, you're literally, regulatory is like the liaison between the company and the health authority. Like you are the middleman. Um, you are doing all of the outreach. You're doing all of the communication, um, whatever forms of communication that may be from an FDA standpoint, Q subs that need to be submitted, um, the deficiencies back and forth between the health authority. Mm -hmm. Regulatory is that person. Like, and we have to manage the project essentially. I mean, you have like, you know, the project managers, but we're managing that submission from the beginning to the end. And a lot of times we're managing up and down, depending on all of the different departments that we have to kind of bring together for this one cohesive submission. Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm going to pass it over to Jeremy. Thank you. And a uh, shout out to the Michigan State University, uh, by the way. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Sequita, you also brought up being part of startups, and uh, I think you and I have that in common. I tell people that it's not for the faint of heart. Not if you make it there. You can probably figure out how to make it work anywhere. So yeah. uh, that's real cool. So um, you both talked about a lot of uh, different things that it seemed like details and, and being um, updated on things that might be changing in the industry is very important for for your roles. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you both stay up to date uh, with all the changing regulations and, and things in your position? You know, sometimes I'm going to be honest, that can be challenging depending on how busy I am. I'm just going to be real. Sometimes my days are 10 hours, 15 hours, 18 hours, depending on what I have going on. So sometimes the last thing I have time for is staying up to date on some regulations. However, what does work for me is making sure I'm signed up with industry um, email blasts with FDA. When there are new guidances that come out, they automatically send me an email um, signing up for um, the pink sheet, which is a really great like regulatory um, a newsletter that gives you downloads and debriefs of daily happenings within the industry um, that includes regulatory highlights. There are a lot of free um, small business association um, webinars that FDA sponsors that um, gives insight into either, either guidances, regulations, new happenings within certain industries like um, the Oncology Center of Excellence. They have like monthly, um, they just had an, a monthly um what do you call it? They had a webinar the other day actually on dose optimization at FDA because that's a hot topic right now. Um, that was a two-day webinar. So webinars, email blasts. Um, I recently also just hired a regulatory policy associate who does weekly surveys of everything that's going on in the environment. So not only in the U.S., but ex-U.S., and she helps to keep the team abreast. So it's kind of a, um, you know, multifaceted thing with, you know, getting those um, inputs from what's going on in the industry. And, you know, when I have, um, you know, the time actively looking at, you know, FDA news, things that are going on at FDA, EMA, Health Canada. Um, so, yeah. Right. And they did have a comment in the chat 
Um, Anisha, if you have any type of uh, links that you can post for for the group, someone asked if you you know have any of those handy. If not, totally fine. But if you you know had any of that, they said they'd appreciate it. Sorry, Sabrina. Sure, I don't have a lot of links. I wonder if it might be better to send them to Danielle to post them to the group because once we close this chat, you won't be able to get those back. So I can send them to you guys. Um, yeah, and we probably can just yep. combine because we yeah. probably have you know similar and different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I know sometimes I can you know also save the chat as well. I don't know if people have the option on their side, but I know I have an option where I can save the chat. But you know, also if you work for I don't know how many people here who are already in pharma and biotech, but sometimes um the companies that you work for have. Um, access to stuff like Thomson Reuters, Cortalis, these regulatory intelligence like um, services that provide um, policy related updates, regulatory related updates. You can search these databases for, mm -hmm. um, you know, things. So, yeah, there are a lot of different avenues. Um, and I know Sequita has a, a couple of others, especially re regarding devices and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, the same, if I'm busy, it is very hard for me to keep up, um, a lot of times, but I do have to make the time because as a RAPS certificate, I mean, a certification holder, I have to keep that certification and I have to have a certain amount of, um, continuing education credits to keep my, um, designation behind my name. So, um, I do try to do webinars that come up from um, RAPS. I mean, you don't have to be a member. It's going to charge a little bit more. But if you are a member, um, and RAPS, again, is not just for medical device. RAPS, which is Regulatory Affairs Professional Society, is also from a pharmaceutical um, biologic standpoint. Um, you could become a member of that. And they have webinars as well as other, like, chapters. Um but they aren't really catered to us like that. Um, but I think that um, just getting that credit just so I can keep my certification is a lot of times what I do and to keep up with what's going on, um, especially if there is big hot topic regulations that are changing. A lot of the times I look at MedTech or I look at Avamed or I look at like FDA news, just as Anisha stated. Um, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. I know a lot of companies and a lot of um, suppliers will provide webinars based on what they provide. This could be, again, around a certain regulation that's a hot topic right now. Um, like for FDA, the, um, uh, they, they have the new uh, regulation that's coming out right now from a quality management standpoint. So there's a lot of, of, of webinars that are going on right now. When EUMDR was a big thing, there was a lot of webinars around that. So I just try to kind of keep my network as well as stay abreast of what's going on by reading different things that may pop up in my emails that I've already kind of subscribed to. Um, but again, it's also, I, I network, with a, network with a lot of friends and coworkers who I've kind of sparked relationships up with who also kind of stay abreast with that and they'll send it over to me if they if they feel like, hey, you want to hear about this or know about this. Um, so. Yeah. Say one more thing. You know what? Also, I found lately that is good if you're if you're a person who learns by like videos and um you know watching people talk on webinars, YouTube, the FDA, EMA Health Canada, they actually have done a lot better job in the past two years of posting um informational sessions on YouTube. So if you're in a company, for example, when the EU clinical trial regulations came out and I was trying to figure out, oh my gosh, what do I need to do? It's so much to learn. I, I, I didn't know where to start. You know, I Googled and all of these videos from different health assessors in the EU specifically, they had these one hour, two hour info sessions and that was really helpful. So you might also want to check YouTube for um, some of those videos from um, the health agencies. 
You know, YouTube's a gold mine. I, I tell people regularly, if you want to find some things out, if you take the time, there's at least a, um, you know, an, an elementary introduction level on most things. If you go out there and look for it, somebody else has thought of that same thing and put out a video about it. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so, uh, moving along, is there a certain skill set uh, or set of qualities that you think are important in this uh, role or that you find are, you know, good things for you to to work on to be successful in this role? Um, I have found that people that have really great communication skills, and that's written communication and oral communication, because you are front and center to all the health agencies, there is a there is a way that you have to, I don't want to say behave, but there's a way that you have to interact with these health agencies to get the information that you need for your company. Um, but that sets the tone of how those program managers and some of the division heads will interact with you. Um, having really good writing skills, I feel like as a regulatory person, 75% of what I do is writing. So if you hate writing and you are not that great, I would encourage you to invest in, you know, some writing courses. There are some extension, um, extension campuses like what UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, Harvard that offers really great medical writing certificates and programs. Because you, at a lot of companies, you are the first person to draft the document um, responses to FDA. Sometimes you're the person who's responsible for drafting the IB. You have to give comments and feedback to your cross-functional team on almost every single document. So if writing is not your strong suit and you're really interested in being in regulatory, you really have to invest your time in making sure that you can develop those skills. Um, also project management. A lot of what we do is project management related. And, you know, those are things that can be learned. Um, but the I found the people on my team who do the best in their role are people who are pretty good at project management, who are really good at communicating with teams. Um, um, I would probably say those are my top three. <coughs> project management, communication, and writing. I think having a background in science helps, especially when you're responsible for understanding some of the scientific rationale behind what you're doing. You're responsible for having conversations with a broad array of people on your team, clinical pharmacologists, statisticians, the CMO. You have to be able to understand what they're saying. And if you don't, that makes it really, really hard to have a conversation with, you know, the pharmacologist about, you know, the mechanism of action issues if you don't understand what that means. You know what I mean? So while you don't necessarily have to have a PhD in science, having some understanding of the concepts that drive your program is important. I, I would agree for sure. Um because I'll give a little quick story is my first time going to FDA um, to talk about the drug eluting stint and um, the serolimus that was around the stint and how it was crystalline formed and how electrically charged and all that good stuff of how it was attached to the stint. The statisticians sound like they were speaking another language. And I was like, what am I doing? And I almost had a little bit of imposter syndrome. I'm not going to lie. I was like, I wasn't prepared. I was not prepared. And I was like, I got to get my mind right. I should have been prepared. I should have known a little bit more than what I came into the room with. Yes, I knew my part as regulatory and maybe they didn't know that part, but I still felt a little bit of like, I don't know, I don't know if I should be here. And so I would agree, definitely making sure that you have at least minimal level understanding of all the various functions that will touch that submission or that 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 area. Um, I, engineering, I had to talk with engineering and device, 
you know, verification and validation, things like that. I, I had no clue when I first got into regulatory sterilization, um, the clinical side, when it comes to doing these studies, when I first got in, I had no clue. And it really, you, unfortunately, you I might have to take some time outside of work just to get where you need to be um, to be that liaison. Because you are, like Anisha said, you are project managing the entire project from multiple cross-functional teams. And to say, well, I don't know, is it, it's not, it's not going to work. Um, I remember someone who was um, my mentor at one point said, if they know more than me and they're not in regulatory, how am I the SME? That, and that, that stuck with me always because I was like, okay, I can't call myself an SME um, subject, subject matter expert. If I don't know my craft is, well as I think I do. Um, so like we said, like she said, communication for sure, knowing your target audience and who you're working with, having that um, technical writing skill. Um, but even in that communication standpoint, you still have to be able to be, and I say firm in your stance because there will be people who say, well, we don't have to really do that. Can't you do it another way? Or can't we do it faster? Or can't we do it the other? you have to sometimes stand firm in your stance and say no to do it the right way we have to do it this way um and and knowing what you're talking about and being confident in what you're talking about um will weed out from someone picking at your skill and thinking that you don't belong there um that that's been stuff that's or items that have kept me kind of going in the industry uh, and they make myself a uh, I feel a, a, a asset to any company that I'm a part of. Awesome. Thank you, Sequita. Um, I, I don't mean to take over, Jeremy, but we're going to have to kind of get to the last questions here as we kind of get to the end of our hour here. We would we do want to have some time left for the audience to ask some questions. Um, so Sequita, that was the perfect leeway into my next question for you. Um, Having to deal with um, imposter syndrome and still having to stand firm in what you know, what are some common misconceptions in your experience that um, you have had to overcome and um, how have you been able to address them and overcome them? Um, I remember when I first got into regulatory, um, they said that regulatory is the police. Like we are always going to stop you from doing something. And I, of course, I don't want you to get 483s, which are uh, uh, responses from FDA and they're going to shut you down. You don't, want, you don't want that. You know, you want to be able to continue manufacturing life-saving products. So of course, um, I have always, I guess, been a little bit more stern when it comes to regulations, interpreting regulation, because that's what you paid before. You know, that's what you brought me in for, um, is to make sure that we are in compliance. So that adversity, just that alone is people seeing you as not as um, approachable to start a project and they may want to do all these different changes and not understand the outcome. You make that one change, how it could affect things. That is something that I've tried to, you know, educate individuals about um, when it comes to anything around regulatory, like if you're going to be able to kind of like do what you need to do, keep the company in compliance with all regulations and standards that these health authorities are looking for you to do. And just being a black woman in a sense, you know, I've already got the stigma behind that. Um, I do sometimes you, you have that, um, what we call imposter syndrome or what sometimes is that you have to be a little bit more um, accommodating to um, other individuals in the company. Uh, so sometimes you do have to dim your light at times. Um, and I have had to do that in certain companies, but I didn't last long there. So um, I think there is a balance of being able to be a awesome regulatory affairs professional and at the same time, still being true to who you are um, and, and, and having those values as, a, as an individual. Nice. Anisha, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Uh, 
really truly understand the breadth and depth of what regulatory affairs does um, and the types of responsibilities that we have cross-functionally. Um, I know I had done a few months back a presentation to medical affairs at my company just to tell them and talk about, well, what does regulatory affairs do? What types of questions can we answer for you? And what types of questions do we answer for the company? And they were kind of blown away, like, oh, we didn't really realize you guys did as much as you do. So I think, um, you know, sometimes people think our scope is very narrow, but we, you know, touch mostly everything across the company. Um, including like, you know, business development, commercial related things, marketing pieces, um, pharmacovigilance. Um, so every single cross-functional team, there are regulatory aspects to what they do that we have to help them with. And so I think that's one thing that most people don't really realize or understand. So it's always nice when there are opportunities for us to speak to our colleagues about, you know, these are the types of things that we do on a daily basis. This is a, these are the projects that we're working on for you and the rest of the company. And I will say that, um, you know, to Sarita's point, there are, the industry generally has a lot of very, very, very smart people, a lot of intelligent, smart, you know, type A folks with 5 million degrees. And I think, you know, in this particular industry, you do have to know how to be, like Sarita said, firm. You have to um, know how to speak up for yourself, being able to communicate um, in a way that people hear you and they don't take your tone as something else. And then they run with it with all the the tropes that they put on, you know, black women, um, which I've gotten at other companies myself, um, you know, but it's something that I love and I've, I've managed to, I'm sure we both have managed to overcome those um, challenges by being in spaces where people generally want you to be there, where they're supportive, they want you to be at the table because those types of companies that show you that they want you to be at the table, we're gonna make space for you. We are interested in what you have to say. It's gonna to be totally different from the company who wants to keep you in this very narrow scope and role. They really maybe don't really care what you have to say, but they want you to do the job and do it over and over and over. And when you're successful, they might not acknowledge it, but they want you to keep going over and over and over to the next one. So, you know, finding the place where you fit, where you're growing is important to, um, you know, is important for all of us as uh, folks, um, women and folks of color in this industry. So it pretty much sounds like to go where you are celebrated and not where you are tolerated. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and don't let anyone dim your light. If you feel like your voice is not being heard or, you know, if your concerns are not being taken seriously, then it's time for a look to look for a new position. Okay, so we are going to jump in for questions. We have about six minutes for questions. I'm going to go through because I did see that a couple of people have posted um, in here as well. So let's see. Anisha, this is for you. She's saying she has oncology knowledge and men's health and now a research coordinator, mostly in, in admin. What are some industries or companies in um Massachusetts that she can look into to educate herself in the language of clinical research I know that there the company there's a specific company that you would want to look into in any specific state I know Danielle probably has some specific um resources for that I know there are training programs free and paid that you can take to become more familiar with clinical research in general um, I know when I first got into the industry, I did one that took me, you know, probably like two or three months to complete, but there are a lot of resources online. Um, you know, if it's something that's specific to regulatory, you know, I can certainly send some of those to you, but if it's something that's specific to 
learning about clinical research in general, um, you know, I can certainly send you some of those resources. And I know Danielle and the Black Women in Clinical Research Organization has a lot of resources already set out for that. Yes, thank you. And I know um, Ann and Teresa. I. Who is that? And uh -huh. Ali? Yes. Who asked that question? And. And okay. And if you could just send me your email address, I'll respond after the call. Okay. And if you want to drop your email address in. The oh, chat yeah. I'll drop it. Yeah, that's a good idea. Here, I'll do that. Sure. Um, so we did have another question about uh, Sequita. What was your degree that you. Um, I have my master's in regulatory affairs. Um, for drugs, medical devices, and biologics from Northeastern University. Okay. And if anyone wants to come off of mute, you can, but please ask one question um, if you have a question. Don't come off mute asking five questions, please. <laughs> Hello, this is Maisha Leonard. I have a question for the panel. Yes, go ahead, Maisha. Okay, thank you. I'm a regulatory veteran as well, and I want to thank you all for the if, the information that was given, but mine is more personal. How do you overcome the trauma of being a Black woman in regulatory, transitioning from a role that was not so supportive to now going into a role that is more supportive. They want to hear your voice and they value your uh, your output. You know, I actually had an experience like that when I was at a very large pharmaceutical company in Philadelphia. I had been there for over four years. And while I loved the work, I felt like I somebody was standing on my neck all the time. Like, you know, somebody wanting to keep me in my place and keep me in this small little corner. Um, and so at a certain point, I just got tired of it because I felt like I wasn't growing. Um, and when I left, I had a conversation with one of the other um, Black women at the company. And she said, you know, Anisha, nobody is mentioning your name at this table. Nobody is mentioning your name for these special programs. While you have a lot of success in the things that you're doing, that is not leading to opportunities for growth up through the organization like some of the others others you know what I'm saying and so when I decided to leave I you know just prayed like Lord just put me in the best place for me to grow and to flourish and where I can have a seat at the table so when I interviewed at my current company the senior VP of technical operations I'll never forget he said you know Anisha you are as smart and intelligent and have a great background like every other VP in this company. And I came in as a senior director of regulatory affairs. And he said, you know what? Before I retire, I'm going to make sure you get promoted to VP. Now, that conversation was possible because he saw in me what I saw in myself. He saw the value that I brought to the company, um, all the hard work and the successes that I had at the company. And he was true to his word and making sure that I had a seat at the table when I came in the door. And he made sure that he kept his promise to me about promotions. So it really is important to get an ally at any company that you're at, a mentor who can make sure that your name is in circles that maybe you're not in to help you get the opportunities and the promotion and the special projects that are going to illuminate who you are as a professional. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. I know we are um, out of time. This has been a great discussion. I just want to make sure that I'm conscious of everyone's time. So I want to thank everyone for joining. Please feel free to drop your LinkedIn URL in the chat. Also, I want to thank my co-hosts, Courtney, Jeremy, and our speakers, Sequita and Anisha, so please feel free to connect with Sequita, Anisha, if you want to learn more about uh, regulatory affairs. And if you have any additional questions, sorry, we were not able to get through all of the questions, but I can save this chat and uh, follow up with Anisha and Sequita to answer some of these additional questions. 
but I just want to say thank you, everyone. And, and if you are interested in pursuing a career in regulatory affairs, don't let anyone stop you. Um, you know, if you need help or support, um, reach out to the professionals. Um, they both have a lot of experience in the industry. And so, um, Sofita, people are asking for your, your email address. And oh, if you okay. guys can drop okay. your LinkedIn URL in the chat. So I will leave the chat open so everyone can connect and gather the information. So thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a great night.